So first I want to thank all of our participants today and all of the people that helped get them through our sleep study. Um, again, none of this could be possible without you. And I also want to thank Kathleen Walker who has been leading the program while I've been out on maternity leave. <laughs> while we'd all love to be able to sleep as soundly and happily as this, we all know the effects of sleep deprivation. We've all had those long nights and woken up or just dragged ourselves out of the bed and struggled. And so what we're trying to understand is while we know the acute effects of sleep deprivation, what are those effects after having years of sleep deprivation or disrupted sleep? So we have many sleep studies across our program, and some of our goals are to understand how chronically disrupted sleep is associated with cognition in healthy older adults, and then to jump into the neurodegenerative processes and to understand how is sleep affected and how is it contributing to some of the deficits that we see both in cognition and emotion and even the physical effects. So our ultimate goals are to develop sufficient data to be able to use sleep as a, as a reliable outcome measure in drug discovery and to also actually be able to improve sleep and waking, because the waking part's important too, um, and to thereby be able to enhance cognition, emotion, and balance. So today I thought I'd tell you about our study on progressive supranuclear palsy and why we're so excited about this. So the sleep nuclei highlighted here, so these nuclei affect the sleep-wake regulation, and these are the same brain regions first affected in progressive supranuclear palsy, which is a tauopathy disease. So based on that, we'd expect highly disrupted sleep. So we have a few parts to our sleep study. The first part is an at-home sleep study where we send people home with these little watches, and we also use headbands and we screen for sleep apnea. And what we see in our healthy older adults is looking from lunchtime to lunchtime across each day. So each line is a 24-hour period. You can see times of high activity and then where it drops off during the rest or sleep periods. And then we see this jump up in activity again the next morning. If we look at individuals with PSP, you see there's a lot more activity during their rest periods. And day to day, there's less of this nice sharp line if we just draw it straight down saying, you know, day to day we have a very similar pattern and we often don't see this in PSP. So to really understand the sleep deprivation or sleep disturbance and circadian disruption that we're seeing using this device, we ask people to come in for an overnight sleep study. And here I'm modeling our equipment that we ask people to wear. So with this device or this gold standard sleep technology, we're able to define how much time someone, it takes someone to fall asleep, and then how much time someone spends in each sleep state across the night, giving an amount of total sleep time, and the number of times someone wakes up, and the total amount of waking during the night. So that was a sample of a healthy control. And here are two samples of someone with PSP. So as a quick glance, you can see there's a lot more purple showing that people were awake a lot more during the night, and the gray lines going up to that purple is showing brief awakenings. So it's highly disrupted. So taking a closer look, we see that there's a significant difference where it takes individuals with PSP significantly longer to initially fall asleep as compared to healthy age-matched controls. I know this is a busy graph, but we're looking at how much time someone spends asleep up to the purple, and then it's a breakdown of what sleep stages they are in. So we can see with individuals with PSP, overall they're sleeping less, they're awake more during the night, and they have less REM sleep as compared to healthy controls. So what about their daytime waking? How is that looking? So we asked people to lay in a dark room for 20 minutes at five times during the day, and we're measuring to see whether they're able to fall asleep, and if they do, what kind of sleep they have. And we found that all of our healthy controls fell asleep during the naps, whereas only three quarters of those with PSP were able to fall asleep at all. When those with PSP did fall asleep, it took them significantly longer to fall asleep and a quarter of those that were able to fall, sorry, a third of those that were able to fall asleep, so a quarter of all the PSPs, 
we found that they had very um, unusual sleep during that napping period, which was similar across that entire third. So overall, we're seeing that individuals with PSB have more disrupted sleep during the night, take longer to fall asleep both during the day and the night, and it may be an indication of an unusual hyperarousal. So then our next question was, is this generalizable across tauopathies or is this specific to PSP? So I'd like to stress this is only preliminary results. We've only seen four individuals with corticobasal syndrome. And at a quick glance again, you can see that compared to PSP, those with corticobasal syndrome have take significantly less time to initially fall asleep, and they look very similar to controls. Again, looking at the sleep patterns during the overnight sleep period, we're seeing that, again, corticobasal syndrome looks very similar to control sleep as opposed to those with PSP. What about during the nap periods, then? Unexpectedly, we found that those with corticobasal syndrome are significantly sleepier or find it easier to fall asleep during the nap periods as compared to those with PSP and even to our healthy controls. So this is suggesting that we see increased daytime sleepiness in corticobasal syndrome and increased arousal preventing planned daytime sleep in PSP. So therefore, the sleep is differentiable between these two similar diseases, similar being that they're caused by a similar protein. So it's possible that the sleep characteristics may be able to differentiate between these diseases. So what's next? We're planning to continue our recruitment efforts to better understand the increased arousal in PSP to determine if night sleep is affected in corticobasal syndrome and determine how these sleep characteristics change with time. And hopefully this will help us to reach our ultimate goals, as I mentioned earlier, of using sleep as an outcome measure in drug discovery and to improve sleep and waking, both in these diseases but across all healthy aging and neurodegenerative disease. And I'd just like to thank again all of our participants and my funding groups. Thank you very much.